Hello everyone, my name is John Dada, the resident pastor of ROCCG Open Heaven Parish here in Accrington, United Kingdom. I welcome you to our YouTube channel. The word you're about to listen to right now, I'm very certain is going to bless you in a huge way. So do well to share the video. And if you haven't already, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like the videos, and turn on your notification button so you don't get to miss out each time a new word is uploaded. And I look forward to hearing your testimonies. Let's dive in. Okay, so I am very excited. I'm very pumped up for our speaker this morning. So I'm just going to be reading her profile so those of us who do not know her you know will have um, an idea of who you're going to be listening to this morning and I'm sure you're going to be very blessed I have been blessed under her ministrations so many times in fact every time I've sat under her ministration amen so pastor Mrs. Wumishita a chartered accountant and the director of Sigma's Accountants Limited is a prolific writer and teacher of God's word with great passion for women and the youths this has inspired her to pioneer the Daniels Youth Network in the UK, an interdominational outreach geared towards raising godly and impactful youths. And the Godly Women Outreach, which holds annually both in the UK and Nigeria. Pastor Wumi is endowed with immense initiative and great capacity for hard work, juggling many responsibilities within the home and ministry. She brings to bear her many remarkable years of leadership experience in both secular and Christian organizations around the world. Strong pillar and an efficient planner who complements the efforts of her husband. She is married to evangelist Goyega Shita and together they are the host of the Fresh Oil Retreat Conference that holds yearly in Nigeria, the UK and the US. Whilst also overseeing the Kingdom Power Ministry international worldwide they are blessed with four amazing biological children and many spiritual children so open heaven accreditation with jesus joy let's rise to our feet as we welcome to the stage the ministry of pastor mrs for come on let's celebrate hallelujah amen Presence of God, shout a big hallelujah. If you know you are happy to be here, shout a bigger hallelujah. I just want us to sing this song to bless the name of the Lord. I love singing it. He says, Now unto the one upon the throne, we raise a sound. Amen. Because you are God 
and God alone. The one who sits upon the throne, we want to say thank you. The giver of life, we want to say thank you. Our sustainer, our keeper, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the, yet another day in the land of the living. We do not take you for granted. We want to thank you for keeping us. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you, oh God, for your mercies, your faithfulness. You have come again this morning to your house. Lord, we ask that you will speak your word to us. You will reach out to every one of us in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that in this service today, the heavens will be opened afresh. Lord, I ask that in this service today, families will receive joy and gladness. Lord, I ask that in this, in this service today, Lord of heaven, there will be a new touch. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, almighty God. For in Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Let's clap our, let's clap our hands as we take our seats. Amen. I want to say thank you so very much. Um, I was about to say Dr. John. <laughs> All right. Pastor Dr. John. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you for this privilege and opportunity to be in your midst. And I do not take it for granted. Church, can we please celebrate our beautiful pastor? <laughs> By God's special grace, I'm a pastor myself, so I know what it takes to um, pastor a congregation. It takes so much. There are times you are struggling to put your thoughts together as to God. What exactly should I preach? What exactly is the message for the people? You know what Paul said? Paul said, Paul said the care of the people in peril, in travelings, in tribulations, in everything. Yet, we must keep going. So let's celebrate her one more time. God bless you, woman of God. And let's celebrate our beautiful daddy in the house also. Because without his support, I'm sure she wouldn't be doing much. Yes. So we celebrate you, sir. God bless you, sir. And all the ministers in the house, God bless you, the workers. God bless you in Jesus' name. And of course, I bring greetings from my dear husband, who graciously also allowed me to be here this morning to be a blessing to the church. I'm here also with one of our ministers, Dickiness Onodeko. God bless you, man. And my beautiful daughter, Belumi. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. So this Sunday has been tagged the Family Sunday. The Family Sunday. And I'm so excited because I, I, I take so much pleasure in seeing family flourish and grow in the knowledge of God. It's one of the things that makes me excited when you talk about family, children, youth, um, women, men, anything that has to do with family, I'm always very excited. Because personally, I'm a family-oriented person. And I took the nature from God. And we're going to be looking quickly at some things that the Bible clearly stated as to how the family should be. At the beginning of creation in Genesis, the Bible tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. He created the creeping things. He created all things. And finally, God said, let us talking about the trinity, let us create man in our own image. And God created man. The Bible says, male and female created he them. And God said, God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In other words, what God was saying is that I'm establishing you, Adam and Eve, into a family unit. Be fruitful. So when God created Adam and Eve, God also created the children in the loins of Adam and Eve. Otherwise, God would not have said, be fruitful and multiply. So God himself instituted the family. The, the family. God set up the family. And so for every one of us who are here, you, are, you either have a family of orientation, the family that birthed you, and or 
the family of, in fact, what's and or oh, and the family of procreation. Amen. That's your new family. So God, there's not none of us that dropped from heaven. Did any of us drop from heaven? No. God brought you to earth through a family. And so God has very, very, very specific and inten intentional purpose for creating the family. Devil knew this and devil came and brought in all sorts of, you know, if the, the first thing devil did was to cause a separation between God and Adam and Eve. I don't want to go us with that story. But the intention of the devil was to cause chaos in the family. He wanted to put the head of Adam and Eve, you know, at longer head with each other. So that the family unit could break. But God knew better. God called them. God punished their sin, no doubt. But God sought for them the fig tree and covered their nakedness. And they ensured that they stayed together. Hallelujah. And I'm praying that in this service today, that mighty hand of God will reach out to every family represented here. In the name of Jesus. Family is going through challenges. Family is going through at times. We receive the touch of God afresh in the name of Jesus. So this, my topic this morning is going to be, yeah, I understand when you have a combined service. It is well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So my topic this morning is going to be the glorious family. We're going to be looking at the glorious family. By the time this service is over, God of heaven, like I said earlier on, we touch each and every family in this place in the name of Jesus. God will make your family a glorious one in the name of Jesus. What is a glorious family? Or what family can we refer to as a glorious family? If a glorious family is that family that is worthy of emulation. A family you look at, father, mother, children, you want to say, oh God, I like this family. I like the way they do things. I like the way they behave. I like the way things are with them. That is a glorious family. And that is the intent, the purpose of God for every family. God wants to make your family a showpiece of his glory. God wants to make my family a showpiece of his power. God wants to make your family an example. He wants your family to be an example of what he created at the beginning. Hallelujah. And per perhaps you are here under the sound of my voice. You are saying, well, I don't even have a family outside of the family of orientation, the family I came from. I don't have a family of my own yet. Perhaps you are here, you are single, and you are still wondering, oh God, when will, I, when will you say to me? Hear the word of the Lord. In Psalm 68, verse 6, the Bible says, God sets what? The solitary. In where? In families. And I'm praying that very soon, God will set you in your own family. In the name of Jesus. Because the word of the Lord tells us that it is no good for man to be alone. It's no good for man to be alone. God wants us to be in companionship. God wants us to be in a community. God wants us to be in relationship. When God created Adam and Eve, he was always visiting them in the cool of the day, he was having relationship, fellowship with them. So if you're here under the sound of my voice, my first prophetic word is to you. And you are lonely, you are single. The God of heaven, by reason of today's service, will reach out to you in the name of Jesus. God will set you in your own family. And it will be a glorious family. And I'm praying for those who are still who are searching and looking for life partner, you will not miss it in the name of Jesus. Amen. You will not miss it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God will help you. You will choose right. So God sets the family, the, 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 the solitary in families. So God loves family. And that's the foundation I want to lay to us this morning. To understand that family is not just one of those things. It is the thing. It's not just, well, I can choose not to. I remember many years ago, about, about 10 or 12 years ago, when I was learning how to drive, my instructor then, by God's special grace, I've got four, four children. So my instructor then said, oh, are you coping with four children? I'm not going to have any child. I looked at him. I said, why? He said, children are demons. I said, what? How would you have, how would you have said that? I said, no, 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 I just want to live my life. I don't want the cares of children. I said, Really? So you're missing something there. You're missing out on something great. 
I said, children, the Bible says that children are the heritage of the Lord. The fruits of the womb, this is reward. Ape is the man whose, whose quiver is full of them. Your quiver may be able to take one. That's fine. Another person's quiver may be able to take two. That's fine. Another person's quiver may be able to take four, five. That's fine. Go according to the size of your quiver. But don't say children are demons. They are not. They are the heritage of the Lord. When God created Adam and Eve, he told them, he said, be fruitful and multiply. I want to say families. If you look at, anytime you look at numbers, you see God making mention of a name of a person and linking it to the genealogy of that person. If you look at Matthew chapter 1, when, when Jesus was to be birthed, it, it was not just a Jesus, the son of God. No, it started from the time of Abraham. And this begat this, this begat that. You think it's a waste of time? No. God was making a point, or the Bible telling us the fact that God is interested in families. And so God took time to put it there in scripture for us. This begat this, this begat that, this begat that, this begat that. It's not for lack of words. It's to prove the fact that God is interested in families. But albeit we say that in the world we live today, there have been lots of aberrations. Lots of, you know, um, deviation from God's perfect plan for family. The perfect plan of God for families is for the man and the woman to stay together and to procreate and bring forth children. So, two men cannot bring forth a child. Neither than can two women bring forth a child. As a matter of fact, God expects the input of the man and the input of the woman in the training of the child. Hallelujah. So having a glorious family is not optional for us as Christians. It's part of our Christian heritage and part of our walk with God. If you say you are a child of God, you know God, you love God, then you must be intentional in putting in effort into your hope, into your family to make it what? Glorious. And I'm praying in this service today, God of heaven will help all of us to put in the work we need to in order to bring forth a glorious family in the name of Jesus. I'm going to be taking my text this morning by God's special grace from the book of um, 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse. Okay. I wasn't sure if the screen would project the scripture, but I can reach from here. 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'll read verse 2 um, to verse. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Bible says, This is a true saying. If a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. Good. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Diligent, sober, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Verse 4. One that must rule well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. gravity. And if a man, for if a man know not how to rule his own house, if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Why am I reading this scripture? I'm reading this scripture to put the weight on how God sees our leadership role in church. And our leadership role at home. I'm reading these scriptures to help us to see how, how God sees a man, a bishop, a worker in church. This and this is home, his family. Many a times we get it wrong that we feel, oh, I'm serving God, I'm serving God, and it doesn't matter what happens at home. It does. Many 
at us, we neglect the home front. And we are, oh, I'm all for Jesus. I'm, all for, I'm going to heaven. I'm all for Jesus. And God is saying, all you are doing, you are just doing on your own. The scripture says, say, if a man does not know how to rule his own house, what, are you, what business do you have? Ruling, teaching anybody in church. So he says, go back to the foundation. Go back to your home. Go back home. Settle things at home. Do your bit at home. You see all the things that is expected of the bishop. And bishop there, don't, don't look at it as a title. Look at it as steward. Whether a bishop, apostle, a pastor, whatever title we coin out of it is all we are all stewards working in the house of God we are all stewards so he says these are the things that is expected these are the things that are expected of a steward someone who will rule in the, in the house of God so God says this is how I weigh this is the weight I put between family and church can I hear a big amen, amen. can I hear a big amen so when we understand the way God views the family, the way God sees the family, as he sees, the way he sees it, vis-a-vis -vis the way he sees the church, he helps us to put attention to the things going on in our homes, our families. We will no longer neglect the things going on. We will no longer put it to the background and say, oh, I'm going to church and it doesn't matter what happens to the children. Oh, I'm going to church. It doesn't matter what happens to my husband. Oh, I'm going to church. It doesn't matter what happens to my wife. Oh, I'm going to church. It doesn't matter what happens. No, it does. Hallelujah. And if you read further, you will see the same thing was said about the deacon. Said, if anybody desire the office of the deacon, this and this and this are expected of the person. So let's move on quickly and now see. In, in scripture, I'm going to quickly tell us three case studies. The case study about one of a family where the man was fervent in his service to God, but the woman was nowhere to be found. I'll tell us another case of, in, the, in scripture of a family where the woman was fervent as it were, but the man was nowhere to be found. Then we will now pitch our tents on looking at the third family who depicts more or less the glorious family God wants all of us to emulate. The first family, so that we don't waste time, we won't read much, much scripture, is the family of Eli. The Bible told us about Eli that Eli was the priest. We can read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and 1 Samuel chapter, I mean, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 20, and 1 Samuel. Chapter 2, verse 12. The Bible said that Eli was the priest in the house of God, but Eli's children, Ophrenia and Phineas, were what? Sons of Belia. The Bible said they did not fear God, no regard for God, no fear of God. When the people bring the sacrifice to the altar of God, what do they do? Rather than them to wait and honor God and the sacrifice that has been brought, they put a long fork and do what? And take out of the meat why it is still on the altar. They disregarded God. And many times the man, the father, comes out to cry, oh my children, what you are doing is wrong. What you are doing is wrong. But that didn't yield much results. And do you know why it didn't yield the results? Because there was no woman. There was no mother figure in the life of those boys. Although the man tried to do his best to bring up the children in the will of the Lord, to make them honor God. But there was no woman to enforce those training. There was no woman to enforce the teaching. Nothing was said about Mrs. Eli. Mrs. Eli was a passive mother. And I'm praying for everyone, every woman in this house this morning. You will not be a passive woman. You will not be a passive mother. You will not be that kind of woman that will say, well, anything they want to do, let them do is their life. It's not their life because it's going to come back to you. Eventually, when God judged the house of Eli, what happened? God told Eli, God said, I have said it before, that you and your children and your household, you are going to take on the, the, the priesthood leadership. He said, but now, no more. Do you know how many families 
how many covenants and blessings have been revoked from certain families all because of a careless mother or a careless father. No record of Mrs. Eli. She was so passive, careless. Abandoned the boys. And of course, when the covenant was revoked by God, they all suffered. You didn't hear about the lineage of Eli again. How about the second family? Because I want us to dwell on the third family more. So I'll just paraphrase the first and two family. The family of Abigail. Remember, talked about the husband. The husband was a very, very brutish man. One who had no regard for God or the men of God. And when David, King David, was, was boiling and was going to kill and destroy the whole family, it was this, it was the wife, Abigail, who rose up to say, ah, after hearing, it was the wife, Abigail, who rose up to meet with David in the field to say, David, please, on behalf of my husband and your family, I beg but that family didn't produce we didn't hear of any child that was produced any anything good out of that family why because the man was a foolish man that would say he was brutish one who had no regard for god i pray in the name of jesus that god will raise our men to be men who love the lord who regard god who regard the things of god in the name of jesus if not for the timely intervention of abigail David would have swept in on them. David would have killed and wiped out the whole household of Naba. But that woman rose up to intervene. Only because she had the information. What if she had not heard? But now let's look at the family we are going to be concentrating our time and attention on. That is the family of Abraham. Isaiah chapter 51 verse from verse 1 and 2. Let's say Isaiah 51 and read verse 1 and 2. He says, I came to me, ye that follow after righteousness. How many of you here follow after righteousness? So this scripture is for us. I follow after righteousness by the grace of God. So this scripture is for me. He said, listen to me, all you that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord. If, you're, if you don't seek the Lord, you won't be here this morning. It's because of your yearning and your desire after God. That's why you are here. And so this word is for us. And God said, listen, all of you that follow after righteousness, all of you that seek the Lord, listen. He said, look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Now verse 2. He said, look unto Abraham your father. And unto Sarah that bear you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him greatly. Wow. Look unto Abraham and look unto who? Sarah. What is it about Abraham and Sarah that we should look unto? And I'm going to be drawing to, to Ross here this morning. The family of Abraham and Sarah is a typical family of, it's a family that represents, an, I mean, a typical family for any one of us to, to, that we can relate with. The family of Abraham and the family of Sarah, they were not perfect, were they? But they still produced a glorious home that God is now asking us to look unto them. Who was Abraham? Who was Sarah? Abraham, we know, we, I want to believe we know the calling of Abraham. When Abraham was called, the Bible tells us that Abraham left all the childies and to go to the place where God had, had called him to go. And he took along with him his wife. And as they went, many things happened. In Genesis chapter 12, we saw how Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, wanted to take I mean, the wife. God intervened. In chapter 20, Abimelech, the king of Gera too, came up wanting to take Sarah. God intervened and they moved on. But particularly chapter 16, after they left Egypt, the Bible said the king of Egypt gave them gifts to compensate for the embarrassment of Sarah. And one of the gifts they received was who? Agar. 
Bible says, as they grew, as they, as they journeyed, and Agar grew with them. A day came in Genesis chapter 16 that if Sarah said to her husband, and said, my husband, Abraham, since God has not given me a child, why don't you go in into Agar and bring forth a seed for us? I don't want to bore you with the story of that. Eventually, Abraham akin to the voice of the wife, and Agar gave back to Ishmael. That was a grievous mistake on the path of who? Of Sarah. That brought in a lot of friction into that family. So this family that God is telling us to look onto is not a perfect family after all. They had their issues. They had crises. They had, the thing, they had their own challenge. Or they had challenges they faced. But God still asked us to look onto them. So what is it about them that we want to learn? What is it about them that Isaiah is reminding us, look onto to Abraham, look onto Sarah. What is it about the family that we want to learn from? And God took me deep into the scripture to say, a lot. Otherwise, the scripture would not have told us to look onto them. They had their mistakes. They had their errors. They were not perfect. But certain things they did, both of them, that made them to stand out. In the midst of that crisis, you know, we have crises that have rocked certain homes, certain families. Crises that have made homes to separate people to pack it all up. But in the midst of their own crisis, they stayed together. One of the things that marked Abraham and Sarah out is the fact that they were willing to discuss the matter. After that, a guy conceived. And Agar began, began to misbehave. <laughs> Sarah called the husband and said, My dear, my wrong be upon you. Look at this house up. Blah, 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 blah. You can know how the woman, a woman would have ranted and, you know, nagged and everything. And Abraham said, Madam, the, your maid is still your maid. Anything you want to do to her, do unto her. Abraham and, and Sarah discussed the matter. Abraham did not say, it's, not, it's your business. After all, you brought her to me. After all, you understand? Abraham did not excuse himself 100% from the whole situation. Abraham still accepted that. Madam, no problem. Anything you want to do to her, feel free and do. The matter was put on the table, number one. Number two, they were also willing to forgive one another. They were willing to forgive one another. Abraham did not say, that is the end. Or neither did Sarah say, that is the end. I'm leaving. They were willing to forgive. They were willing to discuss the matter. They were willing to forgive. And number three, they were also willing to bring God in. You know what Sarah said at the end of the day? He said, my wrong be upon you. He said, but let God judge. We bring God, the judge of the earth, into this matter. They were willing to bring God in into their matter. So one of the things that makes for a glorious family is what you must learn to discuss issues and matters as they arise. The difference between Abraham and Sarah and, I mean, Adam and Eve was because they were not shifting blames. In the case of Adam and Eve in the garden, Adam said, it's the woman you gave me. It's not my fault. I exonerate myself. The woman too looked. Who do I blame? Blame the serpent. But Abraham and Sarah discussed the matter. They put the matter on the table, discussed it. They were willing to forgive. They did not allow that issue, that crisis to rock the boat. They did not allow that crisis to prevent them from moving forward forward together as a family. Mind you, Isaac had not been born at the time. Mind you, they were still expecting the promise of the child. Mind you, the covenant of God with them was yet to be fulfilled. They didn't allow the present situation they faced to prevent them from entering into the future that God had for them. And that's a big lesson to learn from these people, Abraham and Sarah. And eventually, after that, 
Sarah dealt harshly with, with Agar, and Agar left. God met with Agar in the field and said, look, better return back to your mistress. She returned back, gave back to Ishmael. Fast forward now to Genesis chapter 21. The Bible tells us that eventually God visited Sarah. Eventually, God visited Sarah in the home of her husband, Abraham. And God said, and God opened up the womb of Sarah. Sarah conceived and gave birth. When Sarah's son, Isaac, was being dedicated, this boy, Ishmael, had grown then. The Bible says, Sarah saw Ishmael doing what? Mocking. Mocking the child. And at that point, Sarah said, it is time to now draw the line. Sarah said to the husband, Sarah said, Abraham, this son, this bond woman and her son can no longer stay here. The Bible tells us that the thing was grievous in the heart of Abraham. Abraham didn't like it. How would you say my son should leave? But Sarah said, no, this child can no longer stay here. Hear what God did. God came into the matter. You know, at the beginning, I have an issue. They are a family that learned to do what? Bring God into their matter. God came into the matter and said to Abraham, he said, don't be angry for the child. Whatever it is that Sarah said unto you, do exactly. And the Bible says, even though Abraham was not happy to let Ishmael go, even though Abraham was not happy to let Agar go, but for this fact that God had said it, the Bible says, Abraham rose up early in the morning and did what? And sent Agar and the son packing. A man who was willing to obey God, even at his own expense, even on his own heart, he was willing to obey God. Those are the things that made their family glorious. And that's the reason why Isaiah tells us, he said, look unto Abraham. Look unto Sarah. This was, this, a family that was, this was a family that was ready to obey God, ready to forgive, ready to do whatever God tells them to do. And that's what makes for a glorious family. Can I hear a big amen? amen. Can I hear a big amen? amen? So in building a glorious family, we're going to be looking Lastly, at the golden rule in Ephesians chapter 6, chapter 5, and then I'll wrap it up at there. But in looking at a glorious family, it's not a family that is like without fault, as it were. It's not a family that is perfect head to toe, as it were. But it's a family that is ready to discuss matter as it arises. A family that is also willing to forgive easily. Be willing to forgive your husband. Be willing to forgive your, 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 your wife. Be willing to forgive. A family that is also ready to allow God, willing to allow God to come in and be the judge. And whatever God says on the matter becomes what? Final. Abraham was not happy that Sarah suggested that Agar and the son should go, Ishmael. Abraham had bonded so much with Ishmael for those 13 years. But God came. God said, let me go. God came and said, yeah, let her go. Let him go. And Abraham woke up the next morning and said, God has spoken. I don't have a choice. I have to obey. When God speaks to you as a woman, the wife in that home, are you willing, even though it is against your will, are you willing to obey? When God speaks to you as a man, are you willing to let down your ego and say, God has spoken. That has a final authority. Are you willing to obey and accept what God has said? Many a times, the problem we face in our homes is the problem of ego. The problem of not wanting to bend. The problem of pride. The problem of no, 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 no. I'm the head in this home. God is say the head over all of us. And so when God told Abraham, say, Abraham, listen to your wife. Listen to Sarah. On this occasion, listen to her. That is my verdict on this matter. Abraham wasn't happy, but he obeyed God all the same. 
He obeyed God all the same. I pray that the grace for us to obey God at all times. God will release unto us in the name of Jesus. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to be looking at the golden rule for the family. I told us that the family constitutes the husband, the wife, and the children. So what are the roles of the husbands, the roles of the wives and the children? Because all hands must be on deck in order for us to produce this glorious family we are talking about. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 20, I will read uh, um, the husband's role first, verse 25. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Husbands, can you shout hallelujah? hallelujah. Shout, ah, husband, it's not easy to be husband. Husbands, shout a big Hallelujah. Thank you, thank, thank you, sons. Even the children are helping. Even the children are helping their husbands. Are helping their daddies. Thank you, children. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. So the only duty of husband is love. And you say, that's all. Yes, that is all. You don't have any other thing to do than to do what? To love. Just love. Just love. Eh, to love. Just love your wife. That's all. Because all Jesus did for the church was to just love the church. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Love, love, love. How be it? May I break it down for our understanding so that we understand what this love is all about. What does it mean to love? I think the problem maybe people have is they don't even understand the real thing, the, the, the baggage they are carrying. God says, husband, love your wife. That's all, that's all that is the bandaid of it. So what is this love? First Corinthians chapter 13 put this very well for us. Paul Apostle, that great apostle and minister of the gospel said, let's look at First Corinthians chapter 13. We can pick a few things from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So that we understand, so that our men can understand what it means to love their wives. So we are talking about the golden rules. The golden rules that helps us to produce a glorious family. We've seen the example of Abraham and Sarah who had the glorious family. Not because they didn't have Christ in the earth. And they were still able to produce a glorious family. So much more that Isaiah tells us to look unto them. To look unto them. Take a kill from them. Amen. So Paul said, he said, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have no love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. So do I have verse 2 quickly? You say, this is still verse 1, verse 2. Okay. Our media has gone to bed. All right. They are back. You say, and do I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge? And do I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have no charity? I have nothing. And I pause. Now, I'm putting myself in the shoe of the men now. Or even as a child of God, I'm just putting myself. I look at all the things that Paul had listed. I look at my life. With my years of work with God, I do not even measure up to 1,000. One, one How many of us here have the gift of prophecy and you can understand all mysteries? Anybody? How many of us here have all knowledge and all faith? Anybody? We don't even have as much as this. And the man who says, if though I have the gifts of knowledge, 
understanding, prophecy. He said, if I don't have charity along with it, I am nothing. Then I said myself, then me, I am nothing raised to the power of infinity. So without love, you are nothing. Without love, you are nothing. Without charity, you are nothing. Paul, who had mysteries, understanding, knowledge, several times he raised the dead, several times he healed the sick, several times he did a lot of things. In spite of it, he said he's still nothing. Then, most of us, we are nothing raised to the power of infinity. So without love, you are nothing. So what is love? I'm, I'm wrapping up quickly. What is love? Read down that chapter, chapter 13. He said, love is kind. So I want to challenge all our men in the house and give us an exercise. Please go home and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and list out all the things that is embedded in that pursuit you are carrying called love. Love is kind. Are you kind? Your, your wife does a mistake. Are you kind to her? The love is gentle. Love does not, does not promote itself. The agenda in the family, is it promoting you as a person or promoting the interest of the whole family? Love is kind. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love is not rude. Those are all the things God is expecting from the husbands. Can I hear a big amen? amen? So our husbands, as soon as we get to go and make a list of all the things in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that's what God expects you to do for your wife. And God says, husbands, love your wife. Be kind to your wife. Don't be rude to your wife. You should not be easily provoked. Don't think evil. Don't behave yourself unseemly. Don't seek your own interest only. All enumerated there and personalize it. So that is what God is asking you to do to your wife. Are we still here? Husband, shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Ah, the temple has gone down. Shout a bigger hallelujah. Amen. So that is it. He said that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water and the word. That you may present it to himself. Talking about Jesus. See what God, Jesus is doing for us as a church. You sin today. You come back to go, oh Jesus, please forgive me by the blood of Jesus. He forgives. He forgives. You make a mistake today, you come back to God, you come back to Jesus. He's there all the time, willing to embrace. That's what God is expecting from you too as a husband. Be willing to embrace, be willing to forgive, be willing to let by, let by, by gone be by gone. Be willing to open a new chapter. Be willing to pour love upon your wife. That's what it takes for the husband to love the wife. Let's move quickly because it seems I'm saying so much about the husbands now. Don't think they, they, don't think they sent me here for you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Secondly, so I said, husband, you must love your wife. <laughs> husband, you must carry your wife along. Genesis chapter 12, when God called Abraham. Abraham did not say, ah, well, Sarah, God has called me. So I don't know. Anytime I finish on the assignment, I'll come back and meet you. Abraham took Sarah, along on the journey. Carry your wife along. Amen. Listen to your wife's opinion. We saw, we saw that in Genesis 21 verse 12. When God said, on this occasion, Abraham, we have to listen to Sarah. Sarah is saying what is right. Listen to your wife's opinion. Let our opinion count in the matter. Let our opinion count in the hope. Don't, don't, don't put her down. Support your wife in domestic chores. Time will not permit me to tell the story in Genesis chapter 18 when Abraham was to entertain the angels. Abraham did not just bring the visitors home. Only to call Sarah. Sarah, here, we have visitors. So please, quickly prepare. Abraham himself was busy doing the chores. Abraham was busy making what? The meat. While Sarah was busy doing what? The milk and other preparation. All hands on deck. All hands on deck. 
So it's not out of place for our men to get to the kitchen and fix food and fix dinner and fix breakfast and fix things. It's not a place for the men to go and do the groceries and do the shopping. Hallelujah. Remember, we are looking at who? The family of Abraham and Sarah. And finally, for the men, have a large heart. Reach out to others. Let it not just be yourself, your family, your children alone. Reach out to others. Abraham had 380 men that he raised in his house. How about the wife? For the Bible tells us, say, look also unto Sarah, your mother. Who was she? She was a submissive woman. She was a woman who was, do you know how many times she risked her life for the sake of her husband? At one point, I said it in Genesis chapter 12, when King, King, um, King of Egypt wanted, wanted her. And Abraham said, hey, this woman, you are so beautiful. Please just say I'm your sister. Just say I'm your brother. Otherwise, they will kill me. Do you know, Sarah risks her life for the sake of her husband so that her husband will not be killed. What are you bringing? What are you adding to the life of your husband? What value? Are you preserving the life of your family? In Genesis 20, the same scenario happened. <laughs> At a point, I said, Sarah, indeed, you're a woman to be, to be emulated. I said, a second time, and Abraham came again and said, hey, it has happened again. No? Just tell the king. Yeah. If, if I were Sarah, sincerely, at that time, I would say, eh, eh, not this time. You did it before, not again. But God is saying, if that is what is to be done to save your husband, nothing should be too much for you to do. She was a sacrificial woman, a selfless woman. Are you selfless as a woman? God brought you to the life of that man to add value to that man. Please don't let society change you. You are a child of God. Our standard is scripture. We don't move by what the society says. We move by what scripture says. Hallelujah. Amen. Sarah was also a woman who was willing to turn things around in the home. Those 318 I mean, uh, trained soldiers in the men in the house of Abraham. Who do you think was supervising them? It was Sarah. Because she was a woman in the home. She accommodated them. She was accommodating. How accommodating are you as a woman? Or everybody that comes. No, 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 no. 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 She was accommodating. A glorious woman is one who can turn around what has been provided, multiply it, manage it, and also enforce the rules that has been given by the father of the house. Don't give a contrary or opposing instruction to the children. You have to work hand in hand with your husband. Amen. Finally, to children. Because they are part of the family. One instruction God has given to children is that children, you must obey your parents. I will say, children, obey your father and mother in the Lord, that it may be well with you. You must obey. Look at the way they raised Abraham and Isaac. Look at, I mean, Abraham and Sarah. Look at the way they raised Isaac. They raised Isaac in such a way that Isaac was so obedient. When Abraham was to sacrifice Isaac and Isaac was asking some questions and say, ah, daddy, where is the ram? Where is the for sacrifice? Abraham said, well, God will provide. Follow me. We are going. And he obeyed. He accepted. I'm praying that in this generation, God will put into our, the heart of our children the heart to obey in the name of Jesus. I know we live in a generation where why and why and why, why should I do this? Why, 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 why? It's the order of the day. But in the midst of the wise and the wise and explaining all the wise and the wise, I pray God will give them a heart to obey in the name of Jesus. I mean, Isaac obeyed the father and the mom. Even when she, he may not even, she, he may not even have understood what, what the father was doing at the time, but he obeyed all the same. He 
obeyed all the same. What are the things we need to do in order for us to make this glorious family that God has given to us to continue to flourish? Practice number one, you must have family altars. You must have a time where you pray together. In the busy, in, as busy as your schedule may be, you must find the time. For some family, maybe in the morning before everybody rushes out, or in the evening when everybody comes back, or even both. Yeah, but you must have a family altar. Number two, try and have dinner together. If you cannot have breakfast because you are rushing out, have a time. It could be weekend. Maybe, okay, Sunday evening at least. We are not rushing anywhere. Let all of us have dinner together. Have meal together. Dine together. Have time out. Take holidays. Take time out together. Foster unity among every member of the family. And I pray that God will help us in the name of Jesus. Let's rise on our feet as, as I wrap up on this note. God has told us the example to look onto. The example of Sarah and Abraham. The family of Sarah and Abraham. Not a perfect family. Not a family without crisis and its own challenge or challenges. But yet, they survived. Why? Because they were willing to allow God to take the lead. I want you to pray for yourself and say, Father, please help me. Commit your family into the hands of God and begin to ask that God will help you. In the name of Jesus. Yes, ask. Pray for your family. Just pray. Pray for your family. Say, Father, please help me. Help my family. What are the challenges in your own home? What are the challenges you are facing in your family? God is able to solve and resolve any challenge. The, one, the crisis in the home of Abraham was much. It wasn't a small one. It was enough to rock the boat. It was enough to make Abraham and Sarah to part ways. But they brought God in. What are the challenges your children? What are the challenges you are facing with your spouse? Bring God into the matter. Bring him in. Bring him in. Bring him in. Karamo shakata karababa. Rekata ye kata ya boso proto koba sheketeka. Maraga te repo so proto ya masekari maseketeke. Lord, we bring you in into every family, oh Lord. We bring you in into every family this morning. Come in afresh, oh God. Let the challenges let the challenges be resolved. We bring you in into the homes. Every member of this local assembly. We bring you in again afresh, oh God. Into those troubled homes, we bring you in. And we ask of you, Father, that you will come in and take your way and have your way. Come in, oh God. Let the issues be resolved. As so we're bringing him in, I want you to ask that God, please, whatever you say, help me to do. Because it's one thing to bring God in. It's another thing to be willing to accept his verdict. Pray that God will help you to accept the verdict. Pray that God will help you to accept, accept whatever he tells me to do. Help me to do. Help me to do. Help me to do. I want you to pray finally for yourself as a man. Pray that God will help you to be that man after God's heart. That husband according to scripture. As, you, as a woman, pray for yourself. Say, Father, help me to be that woman after scripture. Help me to be a submissive wife. Help me to be a woman after your heart. Help me to be a, and help me indeed. Help me not to be an absentee mother. Pray for yourself as a child and ask that God will help you to be an obedient child. In the name of Jesus. It's the combination of all of these together. Everybody taking their position that produces a glorious family. Lord help us we ask in the name of Jesus. Thank you almighty God. In Jesus name we pray. I want to pray for those who are singles before I take my seat. You are single here and you are trusting God for settlements. Wherever you are, just raise your hand to God. Just raise your hand to God. Father, we want to thank you. God bless you, ma. I pray for all your children raising up their hand this moment. We stand on your word that says you are the God that set the solitary in families. Lord, I ask, oh God, that you will set your children in families. You will set them in glorious families in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask of you, oh God, you will guide their steps aright. They will not choose wrongly in the name of Jesus. Thank you, almighty God. 
in jesus mighty name we pray amen let's clap for jesus